50%. And then, using the pointers that we defined up in the onCreate method of this, it sets the values of these different text edit text fields. So again, the event listener calls that function, and that function actually goes and sets these values. The function that does the calculation can access those variables because those variables were all defined as instance variables for this class. So when you make something an instance variable for a class, any method can access it. Alright? So, I can define and I can grab a pointer to these objects here within the onCreate method and the pointer in those variables is still available on the update standard method. Questions over any of this? All right, on to the slider. They do this a little bit differently, just slightly. I don't know why, just to be tricky, I guess. But they don't make this an instance variable, interestingly enough. Why don't they make it an instance variable? Well, obviously, it doesn't need to be an instance variable. All right. So, what they do instead is they grab a pointer to that seek bar, which is a slider, they use the same technique that we've done before, where we find you by ID and we use the ID in the slider, then we cast it to a seek bar. And then we set a listener on that seek bar to be custom seek bar listener. Again, listener, event handler. This is a seek bar not a edit text. Therefore, it's going to have different events. That's okay, though, right? Because we've told the compiler, hey, this is a seek bar. So I'm going to treat it like a seek bar so I can access all the events and all the methods that are there for a seek bar. And just like a text box, what's the most interesting event from a text box is when you change the value of the text inside of it. What's the most interesting event for a seek bar? Well, when you change the value of the seek bar, when you, when you slide it back and forth. So what we do here is we associate that seek bar with this piece of code. And if we look down, we'll see that that listener is created in a very similar way. So if we scroll down, very similar way as the text um, the text watcher. The text watcher, we declared the text watcher and set an on text changed. The seek bar listener we do the same thing. We create our seek bar listener and we define for it an on progress changed method. When does that on progress changed method get fired up? It gets fired up when the user slides it to the seat bar, when they change it. In fact, we can maybe make some conclusions about exactly when it gets fired off by playing around with the slide. So notice that as I'm sliding it, it might be a little hard to see, you might have to take my word for it, but as I slide it, that tip changes immediately, even before I let it go. So every time that moves, even a little bit, that event gets fired off, all right, and the calculation gets done. Fortunately, in this case, the calculation is really straightforward. It doesn't take up any time at all. It's not like it's running out to the internet and querying a database and, and doing anything that, that might take some time.
time. All right. So that calculation can happen and get updated just as fast as I can slide my finger back and forth. All right. If you really want to test the tablet speed, slide it back and forth and see if, if, if it ever gets out of sync, you know, if it's ever incorrect. You know, see if you can calculate it. You can move your finger faster and it can calculate it. Anyhow, the, the critical event for this listener is on progress changed. Now, I had mentioned before, and again, you know, you might think this is a small point, but I do think it's kind of critical to understand how this stuff works, how the Java code works and how the Android platform works. I mentioned before that we did not make um, that, 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 that seek bar a instance variable. But that's okay because you'll notice one of the arguments on this on progress changed function is a seek bar. So in other words, that listener When the value of the seek bar changes, it calls the listener, and the listener, the on progress change method within the listener, gets passed a copy of the seek bar that's causing all this trouble. <laughs> all right? So therefore, there's no need to have an instance variable, because this guy knows what seek bar is in play here. What's the advantage of doing it this way? The advantage is, is that we could associate maybe the same listener to several different seek bars. All right. Because this listener event gets passed into it. The, the actual seek bar that changed. So if we had two seek bars, maybe one on the top, one on the bottom, we could actually keep those two in sync and do the calculation either way. All that by just having one, um, one seat bar. Now, again, notice that our actual code in that listener is thin. All right? Not much there. And again, that's sort of the characteristics of a good event handler or a good listener code, is that it doesn't do the processing. Its purpose is to connect some user action with our actual code. All right? So the code shouldn't live there. All right? The code shouldn't live there. The code should be somewhere else. And in this case, we grab the percentage based on the progress of the seek bar. Now that progress is going to be a value from 0 to 100 because the seek bar, again, shows in percentages, how far along the, the line is, 0 to 100, which makes it good for tip calculating. All right. And then we call the update custom method to go in and change these guys down here. All right. Questions at this point? To review the highlights of today so far, all right, the new stuff that we covered today was how we hook these different views that are on our user interface with our code. All right. How do we tell it when the user changes the amount of the meal to go and calculate the tip? How do we tell it when the user slides that slide bar to go and, and calculate the custom tip values? The way we'll do that is by associating with our view, whether it be the edit text view or the seek bar view or any other view, we associate that with a listener. All right. What's a listener again? A listener is an event handler. A listener is associated with a uh, with a view, and certain methods on that listener fires off when the user does 
something to the view. All right. So, with a button, when the user clicks on it, some function on a button listener is going to get fired off. For an edit text listener, when the, when the user changes the text, some method is going to get fired off. And finally, with the seek bar, as the user slides the seek bar back and forth, then um, the, um, the method is going to get fired off. So, here we have the listener for the text. Here we have the listener for the seek bar. The code for both is the same, or similar, I should say, where we create a instance variable for the listener, and we define the relevant methods. Our seek bar listener, our seek bar change listener, we have to identify the progress changed on start tracking and stop tracking. On start and stop, we have to define them, but we don't really put anything in there. The one that we're really interested in is the on progress change method. And that event fires off when the user is sliding the slide bar. And what this does is it grabs the progress, it grabs the tip percentage from the, from the slide bar, and calls the appropriate method. The text watcher does a very similar thing. All right? The text watcher, we create the text watcher uh, object, and we define the relevant methods for that object. And the relative, relevant methods for this object are what do we do when the value of the text box changes. So we code the on text change event, which again, grabs a value from the text box and calls those two methods. All right. Given that this is, you know, one of the first applications we looked at, it would be understandable if some of the stuff was a little fuzzy. All right. Let me describe to you the stuff that I think is most important. All right? And probably should be no surprise, but just to, just to be sure. Number one, the different components. The layout XML file, the strings XML file, and the view Java class. You know, know what is in each of those and, and what their purpose is and what their format is. All right? Secondly, how we hook everything together how we use the string values in the layout. All right? How we use the um, layout in the activity itself. And how we connect events on the view with our custom code to go and do things. So, that's really the things to focus on as you go and review this, this application. All right. Questions? Now, just for demonstration, I would like to go and show how we can localize this application. If you notice, we have our values folder. And our values folder simply is the word values. Alright? Let's compare values with drawable dash MDPI. Alright? In one case you have a word. In another case you got a word, a dash, and an abbreviation. The difference between the two is that this with no dash something after it is a default. 
The stuff that appears after the dash is called a resource qualifier. This allows us to, given different situations, use different values, which is exactly what we're doing with those images, right? Depending on the, de uh, the density of the device, we are using either the high density icon, the low density icon, or the medium density icon. So what this does is this says, okay, I have this resource folder, but like this allows me to pick what I'm going to use, which specific resource I'm going to use, depending on certain aspects or, 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 or uh, certain uh, qualities of the device that this is installed on. Well, screen density is just one of the different ways that we can define different resources. Let's do a quick Google. And let's look for a list of Android resource qualifiers. shows you a list of all the resources that you can have and alternative resources. All right. We've already seen We've already seen to develop alternate resources for different screen densities. LDPI, MDPI, HDPI. That's what these guys are. These says, hey, depending on the kind of density that they have, use these alternate resources. But there's a whole bunch of other things. We can have different resources if the, the device is in portrait versus landscape mode. So we can actually change what layout the person gets if they're in portrait versus la uh, landscape mode. We can change it based on whether there's a touch screen or not. We can change it based on the availability of a keyboard. It's almost scary when you go through these, the amount of customization you can make. But this really is what makes application development and, and applications powerful. Because you don't know what kind of device a person has on the other end. All right? And you have to develop your application for a range of devices. So you may develop the same application that looks great on a little itty bitty phone. When you run it on a tablet, it looks like a little postage stamp. All right. Well, what can you do? You can go and supply and say on different sizes of the screen, use a different layout so that you maybe you put more stuff on the screen on a tablet than you do for a, um, a, a, a phone. The one that we're interested in is language and region. And we're just going to focus on language. But, like, the French that they speak in French, France is a little different than the French that they speak in Canada. So you could actually get to that level of detail. That if you are in France and have your phone set to French, it shows you one set of things. And if you are in Canada and have your phone set to French, it shows you a different set of strings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here and I'm going to copy my values folder. And I'm going to paste it. Oops. Paste. 
paste it in here. It'll ask me for a new name, and I'm going to call it values-fr. So I now have my values and my values fr. So what I can do is I can go in to the strings XML file in the values.fr folder, and I can configure what I want my hard code my hard coded strings to be if the device is set to be French. So let's go in here. Who knows French? Gee, un, un peu, right? Yeah. All right. Well, we can pretend by putting le in front of everything that we know French, right? So, I will say le tip calculator. Apologies to anyone that would be watching this that actually does speak French. We're, we're showing our own lack of linguistic skills by doing this, but at least it gets the point across. All right. So I've created this, and I've created it with the resource qualifier of FR. Now, I could use anything with this. I could, I could use any resource qualifier. I could, for example, give different values for the strings if they're on a big screen. All right? Which kind of makes sense, right? If you're on a small screen, maybe you want your labels to be shorter than if they're on a big screen. All right? But in this case, I'm doing it based on the device's language. So let me go and run this. Let me save everything first. Now let me go and run this. Now, because I have not changed my device at all, my device is still set up for English. So it'll, it'll still show me the English values for everything. So it still says everything in English. All right. If I go and exit out of here, Go to my settings. And I go and I change the language of this. Personal, there's language and input. And again, it's currently set to United States English. I can go and I can change that to French. Now all the settings are in French. And if I go back to the application, Notice that everything has left in front of it. Look at calculator, look at total, and so on and so forth. It's very powerful to be able to do that. I mean, can you imagine, think of, of applications that you've written in other contexts, all right? You know, whether they be C-sharp or web-based applications, you know? If you had to take those applications and make it so that people from other countries could use them, what would you do? Well, unless you've taken some steps in advance, all right, um, you know, you'd, have, you'd probably have a hard go of it. And, and internationalization or localization of applications can really be an issue, all right? However, using the components that are built within the Android system, that becomes pretty much a piece of cake, right? Because everything is its own little component. So stuff isn't intertwined together. 
So you can change one thing without messing up something else. All right? So in this particular case, all right, everything else about this changes. I mean, 10% is 10% in the United States or in France, right? No real difference between, between the two. Uh, as far as the math calculations or the interface, I still, when the users type something in, I still want the calculation to occur. The only thing I want difference is the labels. Fortunately for us, those labels are in a, a component by themselves, and I can go and take those labels and create a French version of them. All right? I can do, again, the interesting thing is, and we'll see this as we progress throughout the term, is I can do this for a lot of different resources, for a lot of different resource qualifiers. All right? I could actually create a different layout XML file if my device is in French. Let's go and do that just for laughs. Let me go and copy the layout. Paste it. Now I have a layout FR along with the strings FR. And I could go and I could rearrange some things if I wanted to. If it made sense, let's say culturally, for things to be rearranged. You know, um, there, are, there are languages where um, the, the default for reading is not left to right, but right to left. So if I wanted to lay out my screen to be laid out from you know, the opposite from, I'm very weak on what my right and left hands are. I always have to think about that, so you have to excuse me. The opposite way, from right to left, I could create a different um, screen file, if you're talking about uh, Hebrew or, or Arabic or, or Chinese, all right, which I believe all those go in the opposite direction. So what I'm going to do here is, just for the heck of it, for France, I'm going to just switch some table rows. I'm going to switch, let's say, table row two and uh, one and two. So I'll just go and cut, cut table row two and put it above table row one. And now if I go and run this guy. Notice that they're switched. In other words, in the US version of it, the 10%, 15%, 20% was the top table row. Here it's the second table row. All right. So you have an incredible amount of customization. What does that mean? That means an incredible amount of testing, though, and, and verification. Uh, that is one thing, again, that. Um, even with the fact that Android, there's so many diff different kinds of Android devices, you already have a little bit your back up against the wall as far as testing goes, all right? Because you have many more platforms, that you, you, uh, many more hardware platforms that you could be testing on. But this adds to it as well. The nice thing about this is, is that this is something that the operating system handled. Notice all I did was create those additional files. It's not like I had to put some code in there to, to do that, all right? Um, therefore, I guess the lesson of this is, is if there is something that you want to do differently, depending on some environmental variables, you know, whether it be location, language, screen size, or so on, look into these resource qualifiers before you try to customize.